connection. All right. Um, okay, so I'm glad everybody has stuck around. Um, hopefully, you can make this a little bit um, interesting and entertaining and, and helpful, something that, you know, is useful for everybody. So, yeah, can do that. Good. So, um, just kind of, kind of run through. I'm not used to having one right in front and right to the side. So, um, just kind of my outline for the talk is defining project management, talking through some of the basics, traits of a successful project manager, um, defining success and failure because you can define one, but if you don't know the other one, you know, it's kind of hard to see how you're doing. Um, adapting to the complications, which I think is probably the biggest part of project management, um, and then successful project completion. If I talk too fast or anything like that, please just shout out and let me know. Um, as Roger mentioned, um, I am from the, oh well, went to school in the Northeast, I'm from the Northeast, I originally worked in the Northeast, so my mouth works a little bit faster sometimes. So, uh, so what exactly is project management? Um, from the technical, what I can find in research, it's the planning, organizing, and managing of tasks and resources to accomplish a defined objective. Typically, that is within specific time and cost constraints. Also, the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities in order to meet or exceed stakeholder needs and expectations from a project. So that's all very academic, um, kind of does encompass everything that is project management. But basically, project management is getting a project at the beginning and working it through to the end and hopefully making it all the way to the end in a successful manner and so that everybody is happy. Um, planning is a very essential part of project management. Plans can minimize stress, inspire confidence. I think everybody can, you know, generally understands that if you just go out and you're winging it all the time, that can be a problem. Um, planning, any kind of thing. So you start your academic career, you start your master's thesis, a PhD dissertation, something like that, anything that you're doing project level, um, any kind of project you're working on, you really do need to have a plan. And having that plan in place is the, the first part of project management. And so you're minimizing your stress, inspiring confidence, um, driving communication, that's a big part of the planning at the beginning. Um, it does help to keep your teams united and focused, and it creates accountability. So depending on the size of your project, if it's a huge, big project, it's not just me managing the whole thing and, and taking care of absolutely everything. If it's, a, if it's a really big project, then I'm going to have teams that are working together, and some people are going to be responsible for some aspects of the project, and everybody needs to work together and be accountable to make sure that we're checking things off as we're going along. Um, Someone to make sure that we're keeping deadlines on track, uh, preventing team overload, that can be a big problem, um, taking fear out of change, mitigating risk, and then, of course, since I am in consulting and this is it's all about the bottom line, increasing uh, profitability. Without the planning and effective project management, we essentially would have chaos. Um, you know, you get out there and nobody knows the goals, nobody knows what you're trying to get to, and you also don't know where the end is. Uh, oh, I didn't know I did that. Um, so, the basics of project management, we have initiation, leads to planning and design, to execution, to monitoring and controlling, it can be a loop, you know, kind of a feedback, and then getting to the closing. So, project initiation, essentially, there is a problem that needs to be solved. In the consulting world, typically, it's a, some kind of environmental problem. So my client has a pipeline release right next to a ship channel. That's a problem that needs to be solved. The first thing you need to do is make sure that you're, you know, someone's taking care and stopping that release, and then there's everything that comes after that. So the, the initiation is, okay, we have a problem. The client calls you up in the middle of the night and says, help me, and you say, okay, we have a project to start. So um, it could be, outside of the consulting realm, it could be an academic problem, it could be, um, a request for a proposal or an RFP that comes out from the city of Boston or the water board or something like that, um, you know, that needs consulting services. Um, could be a client request related to something more mundane than a release. So, lots of things. Um, okay. uh, so, project planning and design. All projects definitely require a plan. Uh, proposal might be okay uh, for smaller projects or if they're very detailed. So I'm going to kind of define a proposal is what you send out to a client. Um, and 
again, I guess it could be um, maybe a grant proposal too if we're talking academic. But um, in the consulting round, environmental consulting round, a proposal is when you say, this is the general idea of what I'm going to do to solve your problem. This is how much it's going to cost. If I have a client that I have known for a long time, we have a great relationship, and it's maybe a smaller project, I can write that out in an email and say, you know, hey, Bobby, this is what it's going to take for me to do this. It's going to, you know, I'm going to have a driller come in. It's going to cost them $1,500. It's going to cost X amount for me to do this. And do I have approval to continue or to go ahead and schedule this plan? And that could be the extent of the planning or the initial proposal for that project. On a bigger project, say that pipeline release I was talking about before, you really need to sit down and actually lay out the work plan of, okay, this is we've, we've got the initial work done, so the emergency response is, is taken care of, and now we're moving into how are we gonna mitigate this problem? How are we going to help our client determine where the rest of the problem lies? How are we gonna get this through the agency so that they know that the client is taking care of the problem and we're not gonna continue to have um, you know, further environmental issues resulting from this. So in those cases, you generally do need a much longer, kind of more well thought out proposal. Um, you wanna add details as needed to manage the work, assign duties, track progress, that kind of stuff kind of comes in the planning. I wouldn't necessarily hand that out to the client. To the client, I hand a nice, a nice proposal that says, this is what we're gonna do, this is basically how we're gonna do it, and this is what, what it's gonna cost, um, plus or minus, if they let you do that. Um, experienced project managers may be less formal than, than new project managers. When I'm training new project managers um, at my company, I typically have them write me out something a little bit more formal. It just gets their minds thinking. I also have a budget spreadsheet that honestly I've been using for the last 15 years, um, and I love it. So <laughs> um, that's one of those things that everybody kind of does things their own way. Um, everybody has their own way of, of doing a budget spreadsheet. This happens to be, you know, I like, I like my spreadsheet. So I will give it to anybody that wants it, and they can do what they will with it, but if it's going to help them um, and it helps them stay on track, then you know that's that can be helpful. Um, also, at a minimum, project plans should identify the goals and objectives, the tasks necessary with the details regarding methods. So if I say, okay, we're going to go collect some soil samples and send them to the lab for analysis, that's a great thought. How am I going to collect those soil samples? What am I analyzing for? If I'm analyzing for volatile organic com compounds, VOCs, I need to collect it in a certain way following a certain method to make sure that the results that I get from the lab are valid. What lab am I using? Am I using, you know, I have to make sure I'm using an accredited lab for the state that I'm working in. Assuming I'm working in Texas, TCEQ has to have accredited this lab. Um, those kind of things. Deliverable items and due dates. Um, these can be internal deliverables. Again, if I'm working with a younger project manager and they're doing a bunch of this, you know, kind of the everyday management of things, then we'll sit down at the beginning if it's going to be a long-term project and say, okay, this is where we expect to be. When am I going to get a summary? When am I going to get a little bit of a report on how things are going? Um, internal deadlines typically happen well before external deadlines. Um, just so that you can make sure anything that's going out, to the, out the door to the client or to the state is the very best it can be. Uh, you don't want to send out the initial, the initial summary email as a final work product. Um, so um, also we sent, you know, we want to identify the budget information. Um, you know, always, you know, part of this is calling up your vendors, your, your drillers, your lab and getting proposals, cost proposals from them. So you say, okay, I'm assuming I'm going to collect 35 soil samples. I need them analyzed for these uh, constituents, and this is the turnaround time that I want. Uh, turnaround time being the time from when the sample gets to the lab to when I get the results back. Um, if, I if I say any terms also, by the way, that you don't know, just flag me down. Um, and then also roles and responsibilities for the project team members. Um, so... <laughs> From initiation, we go to uh, the execution and so the monitoring and controlling. And um, that all kind of happens after the planning stage. So now I'm kind of assuming we've moved a little bit forward. The, cl the client said, that's fantastic. I love that budget. Or they said, I hate that budget, but we have to do it anyway. That happens. Um, 
And so you get out there and you're starting to go through those different tasks that you've, you've identified uh, that have to get taken care of um, for this project. So successful execution and monitoring and controlling leads to successful closing or closure of the pro uh, project, right? So with looking at the monitoring and the controlling, the project tasks and work commence in line with the scope. So you want to make sure that you have a defined scope at the beginning to the extent that you can define the scope. What are you going to do for X amount of dollars? Um, changes to the scope need to be kind of kept to a minimum. To, again, it's all kind of to the extent possible. Um, and approved by project sponsors. So that means if we get out there and I put in a soil boring and it's impacted and I thought it was going to be clean, now I have to step out 10 feet. Is that in the budget? Did I already scope and say, okay, we're going to install five borings with the potential to step out as needed. If it's in there and you've already said you might have to do it, then it's covered and generally you're fine. But if you have to step out because maybe you're clean, this was supposed to be your clean boring, and it's not, you need to call the client and make sure that they're okay with you stepping out. Likely they will say yes, but you need to be able to tell them how much that's going to cost. Um, scope changes uh, have timeline and budget ramifications, so that's something you really do need to consider. Um, yeah, charter and change log are updated, so that's as we're keeping kind of track of the project and how things are moving along, you want to make sure that you're updating any schedules. Um, and then as we're moving towards closure, we're keeping that project moving and on track, continue to monitor the budget, continue to monitor, monitor expenses um, and the project progress. And then closure is when the scope is completed, the project rec retrospective is completed. So if we're doing a sit down and we're going to talk through how everything went, then that's great. Documentation saved and archived. Consultants, we tend to save everything. Um, I don't necessarily love saving drafts, so we save them, and then once the final work product goes out, if you can, you can get rid of those drafts because it just makes it confusing. Um, but that's kind of the, the basics of how you get, get through the project management. Um, traits of a successful project manager, um, as you can read up there, um, but you really need to be a problem solver. It's, it's, I think when you start, it's very easy to look at a small project that you're given and say, okay, I can, I can handle this. I have done this kind of groundwater sampling before. This is going to be very easy. Um, the clients, they hire us to solve problems, right? And um, your master's advisor, your dissertation advisor, they have maybe hired, maybe not. Uh, maybe you volunteered to be there, but... Um, you're solving a problem for them, right? They have a research question that they need solved, and so you're helping them answer that problem. Um, but regardless of who the client is, they've hired you to solve a problem, so you need to think ahead to anticipate um, the problems and anticipate what could be kind of coming along, and that's being a problem solver and kind of trying to start anticipating what might happen, good or bad. Uh, you also want to be goal-oriented, goal hardworking, um, you have to, if you don't know what the goal is at the end, if you don't sit there at the project planning stage and say, what's my end point, you have, you, you're just kind of floating around. You don't know where the end is. Um, you want to make sure that um, the workflow is as even and steady as it can be, knowing that there will be bumps in the road. There will be weeks where you're out in the field for 60 hours and it's raining and you're sampling and it is what it is. But you have to keep going as long as it's safe to do so. That's the other thing I don't really touch on here, but safety is paramount, paramount rather, um, when you're doing this kind of field work. Um, so, um, staying focused on the goal is what really kind of keeps things moving forward. Um, you want to be a strong leader, a good communicator. Um, you do want to have a solid grasp on the technical issues. Now, again, as someone coming into the environmental consulting field, as someone relatively new in the field, you're not going to know all of that information. You're not going to have all those years of experience where you learn all of these technical details and everything. So you need to ask those questions. Um, it's, I just the other day gave someone with a year and a half experience a project to manage, and I said, I don't have time to do this. Call me if you have questions. Um, it's a little bit more baptism by fire than some people 
like, um, but I think he can handle it. That's one of the other things is being a more senior project manager, I can look at people that I'm working with and say, oh no, this person I think can handle this. So it's not a very complex project. It's really more about scheduling site visits and writing summary memos and that kind of thing. So I think that's something that he can handle. Um, so long as he sits down and goes through and knows the goal, knows the plan, knows how we're going to get where we're going to get. Um, and also, he knows that if he comes across something in a technical sense that he doesn't understand, he can call and ask. And he can call me, he can call and ask anybody else in the office, anybody else in the company. Someone can help him with those technical issues. Um, that is also part of being a strong leader, a, strong, a good communicator, is you can talk to anybody, you can ask questions, you're not afraid to ask the questions. It's more important that you ask the questions and get an answer than kind of flounder around because floundering around costs money. It can't cost excessive money. Um, it's not good for the bottom line. So, um, let's see. And that brings us to being a good money manager, a good negotiator. Um, many times your clients will come back and say that's too expensive. And so that's why you want to get quotes from subcontractors or vendors that you're going to use so that you can lay that out and say this is how much this stuff costs um, and you know somewhat negotiate with your clients and say okay this is really what it's going to cost I'm, oh, I'm um, we're going to do this on a time and materials basis which means for every hour that we work on the project we're going to bill that hour if we worked on a lump sum basis it would say this project is fifty thousand dollars and you're just going to pay us fifty thousand dollars when we give the, the end result, regardless of how much time and money it costs. So most of my clients prefer time and materials because they know that we're being very accountable. We're going to show them those hours. Um, I have had some that prefer a lump sum. Um, and if you can budget it properly, lump sums can be very profitable. So um, you also want to make sure that you're uh, reliable and credible. Um, when you say you're going to do something, you do it. When you can't answer a question for the client, you tell them, I'm going to find out the answer, I will get right back to you. And you get back to them. You don't want to be telling your clients, oh yes, it's X, Y, and Z, when you really don't know. Because that just, that decreases your credibility. It makes them not trust the work that you're doing. Um, you also need to be willing to take responsibility for team shortcomings and give team members credit for successes. Um, that is part that, that's why, for example, when I, when I gave, um, when is his name, this project, I want him to succeed. I want him to take this opportunity and start becoming a good project manager. And the way to do that is I'm giving him this responsibility. Ultimately, it is my responsibility, right? But I'm giving his, this, him this responsibility so that he can learn and get some credit for actually managing this project. If it goes horribly wrong, it is my fault. And that's fine. And I will take that. I don't think it will go wrong because I'm trusting that he's going to do a good job and he's going to ask me questions. And as we work through the project, it will be moving in the right direction. And I think it also gives people kind of a level of confidence in their, their own selves. If you say, oh, hey, I have this project. I think you're going to be great. Go. No, that is not one of mine. That is not one of mine. They, they make that face. It's not so successful. So um, as the more senior project manager, and even, even as a learning project manager, um, you can delegate the work, but you cannot delegate the, delegate the responsibility, right? Like I just said, it's, it, part, of, part of my job now is making sure that I'm training and I'm teaching people how to be successful project managers, how to look at all of the data that they're getting and make good, solid recommendations or opinions about what they're, what they're doing. Um, but ultimately, at this point, it is my responsibility to make sure these projects go off well. Um, so I can delegate that work out. But if something, if something goes really well, it's all win. You did a great job. If something goes wrong, it just is. Um, the project managers and the bosses that I've worked with in the past 
that have that kind of attitude have really kind of shaped how I have that attitude. Um, and I think it, I think it's a good way to be. So there you go. <laughs> um, so defining success, um, customer requirements are satisfied or exceeded, um, completed within the allotted time frame and budget, and accepted by the customer. Sounds great. Sounds super easy. Like this is fantastic. We can do this without a problem. So if we define success, though, we do have to define failure. Failure is when we have something like scope creep, um, poor requirements gathering, unrealistic planning and scheduling, lack of resources. Um, all of these things lead to budget overruns, which is, again, really bad for the bottom line. Um, scope creep, let me define that for everybody, is I have a scope that, uh, and a plan that we're going to follow and I'm gonna do it for X amount of dollars. And while I'm out there in the field, something kind of happens or the client says, oh, while you're there, can you do this? And you say, oh yeah, okay, I can do that. But you don't run it up the chain and make sure that the client knows, oh yes, that is gonna cost you $500 extra or whatever it's gonna cost, right? Things just kind of keep creeping out of control and you're not sticking within that defined scope. Um, I have found that Generally, it's the in-office kind of stuff that tends you tend to kind of creep, uh, creep a little bit out of control because maybe I'm sitting working on a working on a, um, a project and I'm writing a report and something jogs in my memory about oh I wanted to talk to the client about this but let me just do a little bit of extra research and write up a little memo first and that little memo might take me three hours. Well, can I bill that to the client? I shouldn't if it's not within the defined scope. So uh, you want to make sure that you, you're not letting the scope of your services just extend past what has been um, previously agreed to, um, which can happen if you have poor requirements gathering. So if, again, if I, let me, I'm going to pick on Win again. If I, if I give Wynn a project, but I don't give him all the information about it, and he doesn't ask, and he says, okay, we can do this for $5,000, and it's going to be great, and then I send him out into the field, and maybe he didn't think about, oh, there's a lot of utilities around. I need to use GPR to pre-clear the hole. Oh, I didn't realize I needed to sample for X, Y, and Z. I was just going to sample for this. Um, oh, there's a lot of background information that I didn't consider going to take time to read those documents and, and bring that into our report. That stuff is all part of the requirements gathering. What do I need to be able to do this project? And that leads to the scope creep. Um, unrealistic planning and scheduling. The client wants you out there tomorrow to do 200 phase ones. That's not easy. That's a lot of work. Um, clients always want everything done yesterday, even if the release didn't happen yet. Right? Let's go back to that release I talked about at the beginning happened in October. You know he wanted it solved in September, but it hadn't happened yet. You know, that's kind of the mindset of the clients. They say, oh, well, my job is the most important. My work is the most important. And you do need to treat every client as though they are the most important. That is the life of a consultant. Um, but you also have to be realistic. If you can't get your team out into the field safely to conduct the work, don't tell them you can do it. You know, you don't, I don't ever like to tell a client no, but I will say, no, I can't get out there next week, but I can get out there in two weeks. Because you need enough time to set that plan in motion and you need to, you need enough time to make the plan and then set the plan and schedule everything. If you just go running out into the field without, you know, kind of a, a solid plan or thinking ahead of time, someone's going to get hurt. Um, and that's the worst thing. I don't, that is my biggest thing is I don't ever want anybody getting hurt. So, um, and then with the scope creep and the poor requirements gathering and the unrealistic planning and scheduling, you end up with a lack of resources. And so you have no money. And if you've been promising that you're gonna do something for the client and don't have enough money to do it, sometimes you still have to do it. And so it ends up costing your company. So everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So every plan is great on paper. Um, and then in the immortal words of Mike Tyson, we take it. So, okay, so here we go. Um, so, okay, 
after we've gotten punched in the mouth, now we have to adapt to the complications. And this is part of project management that is kind of, I think, my biggest thing about project management. You really have to be fluid. Um, I don't, putting it out there, I don't love change. I don't love surprises, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but they come up and you have to deal with them. Um, so what we have here is kind of our resource triangle, shall we say. And you have your schedule, which is the time, you have your budget, which is the cost, and you have your scope, which are the requirements. Um, complications arise, and all project managers have to deal with this resource triangle. Um, you can prioritize one of them. You can optimize the second, and then you have to accept the third. Because you cannot have something that happens super fast or super cheap and hits all of the requirements that are in the scope. It's just not going to work out. Um, so part of successful project management and part of um, kind of moving projects along and, and having a good outcome is making sure that you have that schedule and you say, okay, this is a realistic schedule. I honestly, I tend to give a little bit extra in terms of the time. If, so, if the driller comes in and says, okay, we can do 10 borings to 50 feet in five days, then I typically will say, okay, that's gonna take seven days. That's gonna take eight days, depending how deep I'm going. What, what does the area look like? Have I worked in that area before? Do I already know that that's not true? Um, you know, because drillers wanna be as economical as well um, and stuff, um, especially when they're working on a time and materials basis as well. Um, from a budgeting perspective, and this is where we can kind of have some some issues when you're bidding, maybe on a big um, a big project for the state or for um, even some some private clients. You know, they'll put out a bid, they'll they'll put out a request for a proposal, and you know that my company, company X, company Y, company Q, they're all going to put in bids. For this and you know you know in general you should know your competitors and what they tend to do um, some competitors some some companies do low bid things all the time um, and so when they're putting together the project budget they'll go back on this request for a proposal and say oh I can do it for a hundred thousand dollars if you've sat down and you go through all the numbers and you can't do it for less than you know 200 then you know that that's crazy and sometimes you get that information from them, from the client, sometimes you don't. But um, what you do have to consider is you don't want to underbid and then constantly have to ask for change orders. Many times you will get change orders and whatnot, but it just leaves a bad taste. It's not something that I prefer doing. It's not something the companies I have worked for tend to prefer doing. Um, so maybe that's just how I've grown up in the industry. But um, you, want to, you do want to make sure that your budget will actually be one that you can stay it with it and that you can that you will be profitable when you get to the end of it um, and your company therefore that means your company will be making money on it um, but there are times when you can you, you can decrease things a little bit um, billing rates and a thing but you want to make sure that you can handle the scope or the requirements within the budget that you've set um, so Oh no, it's still going to record. Ha ha, I just learned something new. It's wow. still recording. Again, with adapting to the complications, so most, plan, most of the plan should survive. So you have this great plan that you have set in place. And it's a good plan. It's not, we're not, if we don't change the, you know, the scope, if we don't change the problem, then the plan should in general stay. Um, but there are times when, again, you might have to step out. You client says they want other samples taken. Other things arise. Rain delays. Not a whole lot of rain lately, but we could. Um, and so you want to adapt the current plan to cope with the change, and you don't want to just throw the whole thing out and start over. Um, 
the new plan needs to deal with the current reality. So when you're setting the project plan at the beginning, you're doing the best that you can with the information you have at the moment. So when you get halfway through the project and all of these other things maybe have arisen, you do need to adapt that plan and deal with the current reality, what is going on now. Um, you need to rely on team members to solve the problem themselves as well. That's the other thing about kind of empowering your project managers as you're teaching and as they're learning. Um, let them try and solve the problem themselves. At the same time, let them know that they can call you if they have any problems or questions. Um, you should, your, your field staff, anybody that you're sending out to do the work, and you might be going out to do the work yourself, right? Um, anybody that's, that's going out there to help you should be able to call you and say, I'm having a problem, I need help. And that's just, in my opinion, the mark of, of a good task manager, a good project manager. Um, they need to understand the why behind the what, and I think that also helps them figure out, figure out the solutions themselves too. If they don't understand why they're out there doing what they're doing, then it's just they're going out there, they're gonna do the work, and they're not gonna think about what it all means. If they have a reason for it, if they know why we're out there doing what we're doing, then they can try and solve that problem themselves. They also have to have the authority to do it. Um, there are a lot of project managers I've worked with in the past who are very kind of micromanagey. Um, some people require micromanagement, and it just, that's just, that's how they thrive, and that's great. And I think as a, a seasoned project manager, you can identify those people and you can say, I still think you're gonna be a great project manager, but I'm gonna check in with you a little bit more often. I'm gonna make sure that we're on task and we're moving in the right direction so that we don't spin out of control. This other person over here, okay, let me know when you're 50% done. And that might be all the check-in that you need. And so it's just kind of noting, knowing your personnel, who are you working with, and what kind of level of oversight do they need. Um, you don't ever really want people to spin out of control. It makes them feel somewhat worthless. It makes the project budget just skyrocket and a lot of times you can't necessarily recover some of that. Um, and it makes the client uncomfortable if people are kind of spinning out of control. Um, okay, so successful project completion. So as a reminder, this is how we already have defined success. Um, we kind of walked through some potential complications, um, how to adapt. And so I guess I didn't totally touch on some of the complications you can have, but they could be anything. It could be a weather delay. It could be, um, could be your, your driller didn't show up with boots. I mean, I've had it happen. I had a driller show up without a hard hat one time. Um, and he asked if we could borrow mine. So I pulled out the pink one that I keep in my duffel bag. And he asked if he could use my gray one. I said, no, 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 you can use my pink one. I love my pink hard hat, but I'm in the gray hard hat. Uh, he never showed up without a hard hat again. He showed up without his boots. I couldn't help him on that one. But those kind of things, these are seemingly random things. But I had a rig shut down for half the day because the guy had to go get his boots, right? So these kind of things, it's, it's really kind of how you play them. If you get completely blown out of control and you just you know, your mind explodes and you can't handle it, you're gonna have a hard time being a good project manager. You're gonna have a hard time getting projects moving forward towards a successful completion. Um, sometimes there are things completely beyond your control. You've packaged up your samples really well. You gotta keep everything on ice. You wrapped it all up, nothing's leaking. You bring it to FedEx, they take it, and it gets lost. Or it, <laughs> or it you know, there was a Saturday delivery sticker on it and they didn't deliver it till Monday. It happens, it happens. I've had uh, recently, actually I've had um, FedEx call a client and or call a lab and say, we can no longer guarantee overnight delivery. And I said, FedEx, that is literally your job, overnight delivery. But you have to adapt to that. You have to understand that, okay, I need to make sure, what's a different way? Do I have to FedEx something or UPS or send it via mail? Can I stick it on a bus? In, I've done a lot of work down in Corpus, and we stick a lot of stuff on, on the Greyhound. We just stick it, and they just bring it over to Houston to the lab. It works, works really well. Um, so kind of thinking outside of those boxes, um, what, what can I do? How can I kind of try and mitigate these problems? Well, do you want to be collecting samples at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon? No, you don't because there's not necessarily gonna be anybody at the lab to collect them on Saturday unless you've arranged it ahead of time. So 
all of these kind of things, everything can kind of lead to some kind of complication. Um, but thinking about it ahead of time and trying to be cognizant of all of that kind of stuff, again, it comes with experience, right? Just like your field bag. I had 10 years worth of field experience and my field bag, everything I could possibly need was in that field bag. It got stolen out of my car. They left the boots, so that was good. Um, but everything I needed was in that bag. And so now I had to spend time figuring out what was it that I had in there? I didn't even remember everything that I had in there. I just knew that it was perfect. And so it's kind of the same thing. Over the years, as you're working and, and you get to the point where now you have 17, 18 years experience and you are a project manager and this is what you do. And you look back and you say, huh, all of these little things that I kind of picked up along the way, um, that's how I'm able to have my customers happy. That's how I'm able to have them call me up and say, I have a problem, I need you to solve it. Um, being honest about the budget, being honest about the schedule, and making sure the client is happy with the work product. This is how, you know, over the years as you're working towards becoming a successful project manager, this is, this is kind of all the stuff that you pick up along the way. Um, so successful project completion. Is the project team happy with the results? Right. So a lot of times, you know, especially in the consulting industry, you go from one project to the next, to the next, to the next. You could, if you're more of an office person, you can go from one to the next, to the next, to the next in just a day. Since you're not driving around anywhere, you're not actually out in the field, you, you're working on projects all throughout the day. Um, it's good to try and sit down with the project team at some point and say, let's do kind of a postmortem. Let's do um, an after action review, you know, we tend to do those if there's a health and safety issue, right? So somebody gets heat stroke and you stop work and then you have a sit down and you figure out how could we have mitigated this problem? How could we have not had this happen? Uh, don't work in Texas in the middle of the summer. Okay, we can't take that off the list. So how can we help in other ways? Um, but it's good to do that with projects on the whole, right? So that pipeline release, Let's have a sit down when we're at the part. We've just turned in the APAR to the state, and now there's nothing I have to do on that site besides just check and make sure we're not releasing anything back into the ship channel again until I get the APAR back and they say do X, Y, and Z, or this is great, write me a, you know, a wrap. Write me something that, you know, how are we going to continue monitoring this until it's closed and all the product is gone, right? Sit down with that project team and, and go through, was the budget enough? Did we have to ask for change orders? Um, was, the, you know, sometimes sometimes you budget a project and everything goes so, so well, it's the unicorn of projects and you have money left over at the end. I think most companies would say you don't want to leave any money on the table at the end of the day, but if you have successfully completed the project because everything has gone right and you're leaving a little bit on the, you know, at the end, and you can say to the client, look, I actually saved you money from what I thought it was going to be. Depending on your relationship with that client, you know, next time they might come back and say, well, now you have 10% less. But I have had clients over the years who say, okay, good. We can roll it into next year. Or we can, you know, I know that when you're billing me, you're billing me honestly. And you're saying, this is what I think it's going to take. I'm adding in a little contingency time, a little contingency money. But I'm not going to bill you for it if I don't use it. And I think having that relationship and having that kind of thought, um, of, you know, going into a project is really good for clients. I think they appreciate that kind of thinking. And so sitting down with your project team and saying, was that budget good? Was the scheduling good? Was there anything we could do differently? Did we have a snafu with the lab? Did we, you know, did, did we have anything that came up that was kind of outside of the realm that we had to adapt to? How did we adapt to that? Um, and let your more junior, I will say, let your more junior folks respond and give their ideas and take, you know, kind of take heed of those ideas and listen to them and say, okay, that's, I didn't think of that. Um, I mean, I, every time I go out in the field, I'm not a field lead anymore, right? I don't go out there and sit behind a drill rig and I'm the one in charge and doing all this stuff. I would go out and do that, but somebody else is always in charge. Um, in the field because that's kind of my job right now is not to be that field lead and that's fine 
But every time I go out in the field, I try and learn something from the people that are out there. I had a technician who was in school to be a geologist, um, probably six months away from graduating. And I went out with him to teach him how to log soils and all of this kind of stuff at a refinery. And we're out there. And I was eight months pregnant. So there was that. But he, I walked him through how to do it. And I said, this is how, you know, I set up my table this way. And I double glove because I don't want to contaminate anything on my hands and stuff. But then I write on a little piece of paper the, the core ID and the depth. And I take a picture of it. And then I take a picture of the core. And he said, oh, you know what I do? We're going to do a 10-foot core. We're going to sample it in two-foot sections. So we put on like five pairs of gloves. But he started at the bottom and he wrote 8 to 10. He wrote the ID. He wrote 8 to 10 on his hand. And then he put the next one on, the next one on, so that the top one said the core ID, and it was 0 to 2. So he took a picture of that and then the core, and went through, sampled, did what he had to do, took those gloves off, threw them away. Got it. Um, took those gloves off, threw them away. And I was like, this is fantastic. We don't have little pieces of paper flying all around the place, right? So having him as part of my product team, learning from him every single time, that's something that I think good project managers try to do. Is your client happy with the results? Did you come in under budget? Yes. Did you give them the news, good, bad, or ugly? Yes. OK, as long as they accept it. You know, sometimes it's not good news. Um, is the client eager and excited to have you solve more problems in the future? That's a successful completion of a project. Um, budget tracking and all that kind of stuff. I know I mentioned that a little bit earlier, but scope creep is really what drives budget increases and that kind of thing. Um, my recommendation is to never intentionally underbid a project unless you really know what you're getting into. Um, at the point, I think, where most of us are at, um, that would have to be higher, a higher up decision, right? Even I would go, you know, if, if I wanted to intentionally underbid a project, I would have to talk to my boss and I would have to talk to who's the COO and the CEO, CEO and make sure that they're okay with doing that. I don't like doing it. It makes me too nervous. Um, so um, I try not to do that at all possible. Um, and then as you're, when you're doing the work product, when you're sending the results out the door, you need to make sure that you've gone through quality assurance, quality control. The client does not want to get a report that has a bunch of typos in it, um, typos being any kind of grammatical error or more importantly, number errors, so problems on your data tables. Um, so you do need to make sure that you're going through and you're making sure that everything is, you know, running through quality assurance, quality control, everything is going out the door in as pristine a condition as it can. Um, so, uh, but I guess, questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, so for the, Recording. The question was about contingencies. Do I have a typical contingency amount that I keep in a budget? Um, I think for any kind, any time we're doing engineering projects, engineers tend to put in a plus minus 20%, 25%, could be 50%. Um, on the normal, just remedial investigation side, um, Again, I don't think I have anything that's really standard. It's just, you know, when I'm, if I'm working in Houston, I, my, my company right now that I work for um, is, you know, my Texas operations is really based in Houston, right? And so if I'm working in and around Houston, I don't have a huge, I don't have a huge big need for a contingency per se, because it's somewhat local. If I'm going to Corpus Christi, if I have to go out to Dallas, if I have to come out here, then I tend to put in, you know, a little bit extra for travel. Um, maybe make sure I put in an extra hotel day, an extra vehicle rental, and some extra time, um, just because of the travel associated with it. Um, if I had people out here, on my old company, I had um, an office down in Corpus as well, and so that wasn't a huge big issue down there. Um, you know, but I do, I do tend to put some in. I try not to make it too much because, again, you know, if it's a big project. You can kind of let them know that there's a little bit of extra in there. If it's a small project and a very tight budget, there's not generally a lot of room for contingent contingency. So, yes. Yes. So, what is this 
a lot of cost involved with doing the proposal, but it's not real, mm -hmm. right? So, in your experience, what's like the smallest project you would generally think that actually makes sense financially for you to do? Is it a $5,000 project, a $2,000 project, a $20,000 project? Where does it really, you know, come not profitable for you to think you uh, okay, so the question was, what is the minimum number, I guess, what's the smallest budget project that would be, that I would take that's profitable? I think it really depends on the type of project, right? If somebody says, oh, I need to go out and do a drilling project and I have that release, we need to delineate it, we need to do the lab work, um, that's not going to be a $5,000 project per se, right? That's going to be a, a larger budget project. Um, however, I do have a client right now that is somewhat nervous, shall we say, which is good for us, right? Because every time something spills, he wants a delineation and he, he wants an APOC. Uh, every single time, um, affected area, affected property area report, right? Is that right? Did I get that right? Um, but assessment report, that's what it was. Um, so every time. So he has a little bit of a release and he wants samples collected and he wants to run through the whole thing and so but I can do depending on on that release I know that client I know the I know the the plant um, we can do a proposal and it's more of an email proposal so it doesn't take a huge long time to do and that might be a that might be a five thousand dollar project it might be a three thousand dollar project for the initial go out sample write up a memo right if he wants to actually proceed and go further with the investigation and any part and all that, that can take a little bit longer, but at, le at least then you have that initial, say, $3,000 project. Um, if there's a, if, let's see, if there's a lot of background information or if there's a lot of, if there are a lot of questions about a project that I don't, I can't get answered sufficiently, um, and it looks like it's taking a long time to develop a, a scope and a budget, I might decline. Um, but in general, um, I think the smaller projects, we, you know, or, or a phase one and that kind of thing. My company doesn't do, we do phase ones, we do them. We don't do a ton of them, they're not our bread and butter, um, and we have a standard template. So there's not a whole lot of extra work that has to go into that. You just have to make sure you're reading through it because phase ones, of course, um, are associated with a lot of risk for the for the consultant. So, um, but you know, those there's a if it's in and around Houston, we can do that for three thousand dollars. Let's say if it's out in Midland, it's going to take us longer to get there, so it's going to cost a little more. That kind of thing. Um, there, there is a ton of competition, and that's and that's great because that means that's less that we have to do. I like the I like the big complex projects where something is spilled and you have to go figure out where it got to and what the issue is and how deep did it go and did it impact the groundwater and all of that. Those are the fun problems I like solving. The phase ones I don't I don't totally love doing, but that's why there are companies that do that. They are just phase one companies, and they'll give you a really good price on them, and you can. They can have at it when they have when they come across a problem and they need a hole put in the ground. They can call me and I will handle that no problem. So, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be any of them. To be perfectly honest, the if you know that you know like the the bus leaves at 6:30 p.m. and it's from Corpus and it's going to get to um, Houston at 11, then or 11:30, let's say if they're driving speed limit ish. Um, you know, the, and they can ha I can have somebody at the lab pick them up. To me, that just makes me feel a little bit better. There's there's less room for error. Plus, it's getting there faster, right? If I have to overnight ship something, um, I really everything has to generally be kept on ice. It has to arrive at the lab at four degrees C plus or minus uh, one degree, plus or minus one degree. <laughs> um, and so it's it can be difficult. I have had um, I had an issue where we had some samples just kind of sit in the in the happen to be FedEx. It could be US uh, UPS. It could be USPS. It, you know, um, sit in the warehouse 
because it just wasn't grabbed. It was dropped off in time and everything, but it just wasn't grabbed and put onto whatever vehicle or brought to the airport or whatever it was. But once it's outside of my custody, um, I, it's not, I don't have control over it anymore. If I can put it on a bus and I know that there's going to be a loud person at the bus stop to pick it up at the end, it just can be a little bit helpful. But that, yeah. Buy a ticket or oh no, it's um oh no. Um generally the labs that will use Greyhound um or busing of some sort, uh they have a setup with and so typically typically um shipping to labs is included in their costs to you. So they'll send when they send me the cooler full of glassware and everything and labels and chains of custody and all that, they'll send me a FedEx label. And they'll say, okay, slap this on, put the Saturday delivery on, and it should be good. Because they they do enough business, they'll get a decreased cost with, with whatever shipping company. So they do the same thing with the uh, uh, with uh, great. Yes. Um, so yes. Yeah. So yeah, so a custody seal would basically be you you put this sticker over the edge tape it all up and everything, and if somebody else opens it, um, you know, and it's broken, then, yeah, you have to, you've got issues with the sampling. I actually had an issue with um, a drug test. My company does, we do hair follicle drug tests, and so you have to go every year, and um, they take just a little snip, and they package it all up, but I had an issue where the nurse who had done my hair follicle test didn't seal it, seal the custody seal property, properly and I came back with a no no result. Let me tell you, getting a call from HR about that was not amusing. Um, but we got it taken care of. It wasn't, you know, it was just a no result, so I had to go back and get it done again. But um, custody seals are important. So yeah. Um, so depending on what you're analyzing for, um, if it's VOCs, SVOCs, all of these things, um, your your VOCs can everything can volatilize. Out, um, and you can, you know, just lose the integrity of the sample. Um, if you're doing some kind of, uh, you know, I don't want to say nitrates because that's super quick, but um, some, you know, you can start growing bugs um, and stuff. And just you want to keep the samples just as cold. You don't want to freeze them. They need to be very, very cold, but not frozen. Um, and then the lab can take them and they will do what they have to do and do the extractions and that kind of thing. Yes. Right. Nutrient 